APB, All Points Bulletin, not today. In my world, that's an archaic pedagogical box, or at least perceived, because I believe that you can get out. You know, personally exhausted of reading in the media about low-performing schools failing high-stakes tests, the question really becomes, why haven't we fixed our low-performing broken schools yet? And I contend it's because we're in that APB. You know, it might sound crazy, but at the Chattanooga Girls Leadership Academy, a business model was the answer to what we school rats call an essential question of how. When given an ultimatum, you'll figure out how to fix the issue. And we've proven at CGLA that you can take any low-performing school from the bottom 5% to the top 5% in the state for progress as mandated by those crazy state tests in as little as nine months, sustain it, go from the brink of closure to reward school status, and guess what, folks? We've got the banners to prove it. You know, this wasn't my first school assignment. April 1, 04, yes, April Fool's Day, no mistake, maybe I was the only foolish one walking around that day. I was handed the Howard School assignment. Eight years later comes along CGLA, a 6 through 12 STEM school for girls, low income, 97%, and to be honest, I'll track shortly thereafter. And both schools in need of what I call more than reform. I call it overhauling. And schools in trouble, they have similarities. I'll tell you a quick story. I call it the light bulb story. Went to the first school, concession stand at the uh, football field. In the back, the light didn't work. I said to personnel, why didn't this work? And they said, hadn't worked three or four years since the flood. Went to the other school, equipment room. Why doesn't this light work? Hadn't worked since we've been here. Elaine makes a note of this. Monday morning, I go to the custodian and say, uh, can you put a light bulb in those rooms and tell me what happens? He comes back and he says, hey, Doc, works just fine. I tell you that story to say, sometimes it's not even the switch. It's leaders operating in what? An archaic pedagogical box and not asking the right questions. You know, Changing schools is not that complex. Yes, is it difficult? And in a business model, we know that the devil is really where? In the details. I'll tell you, I think my first school reform book is going to be, school reform, is it the switch or the light bulb? But more importantly, do the leaders know? When I walked into Howard, I was handed a 26 proficiency rate in Algebra 1. I thought that was bad until I came to CGLA. Only 6% of the students, 6%, were proficient in sixth grade math, Algebra 1, this big old number right here in Algebra 2, and 81% of the kids last year came in behind in reading in our entrance point in the sixth grade. And you say, well, how do you take a school like that, that dismal data from the brink of closure to reward school status? I contend that a business model with business approaches allowed us to realize the highest percentage of academic performance in the Hamilton County School District and score at or above the state in Algebra 1, Algebra 2, English 1, among others. In other words, we took that dismal data, as you can see, from 67% increase over a two-year period. We went from zero to 64 in Algebra 2. Now, what if all schools, all public schools, had the autonomy of this public charter? And let me say, yes, where all God's children do and can attend, what would that do for education with that autonomy in your hands untied? I tell you, you know, we looked at the paradigm at CGLA a little bit differently, that of a publicly traded company, if you will. If you educate at really high levels, you stand to gain a lot, don't you? But if you don't, boy, you lose a lot of profits. And are businesses allowed to operate it, continue to operate at a loss? I don't think so. And neither was CGLA. 
I remember in August 2012, the founder and I went to the superintendent and said, what must we do to keep this school open for our girls? And rightly so, he looked at us and said, improve that academic data. Well, Elaine knew right then that this slow molasses incremental change would not work. At the time, we were one of six schools on the low performing list in Hamilton County. I like to say there were six, now there are five, and we're not one of them. And so you're not going to win any popularity contest running a business model, I can tell you that. I've always said I've never gone into one school and found one children issue. Nope. Adults deter education. Children are there merely to learn. And doesn't it seem kind of hypocritical that education systems would encourage exploration and innovation and yet put teachers and leaders in what? These archaic pedagogical boxes. Particularly when you're talking about a low-performing urban school, creativity is paramount if we're to beat the odds against us. And you say, what odds? Well, I have to take this opportunity, and it's probably for another one, but how about mandated tests causing what I call class distinction? And I'm not talking about upper school and lower school. I'm talking about between lower, middle, and upper class. You see, I have kids who come in that 81% behind in reading, no skills, no exposure, and I'm supposed to have them in a nine-month period in the same place as advantage students. Hmm. Well, you say, well, how did you create the innovative space to allow us to extinguish what? That APB. When, remember, just three years ago, we were one testing cycle away from closure. Well, I'll tell you, I think it's three things. I think it's leadership with passion, accountability, and understanding the pace of change. But we'll start with leadership as a verb. Achieving, believing, and processing. It's up to me as the leader to make sure that we're achieving at very high academic levels through measurements and accountability with purpose and passion. But it's also believing that you cannot take a low-performing urban school and bring it up to equal proportions. Folks, equal has never worked. It won't work. And we need to be thinking and fighting for equity in these schools. And then processing. We established what I call focal points. And for the sake of time, it was setting goals. It was making those explicit. It was making sure that we were operating at this high level. It was all of those things. And within those focal points, we planned to stay open in spite of the dismal data. As a matter of fact, we started renovating among all that time. We were crazy, yes. <laughs> but we also, as leaders, set theme songs. And the first one was, staying alive, staying alive, I, I. And the second one was, I will survive. And by the third year, we were singing what in the fourth year? We are the champ. You, you get the message. We also had to look at administration. The school's been in existence for seven years. I am the fourth administrator in that building. We had three different administrators for three different years. We committed to children. Because when we went, the kids said to us, we need someone who will stick with us and believe in us. And then we created what Elaine calls the home side of school. You have to be an aunt, an uncle, a mother, a brother, whatever you want to be. <laughs> Some of them call me grandmother. I'm okay with that. I don't know if I look like a grandma. I'm okay with that. We teach, we preach, we care, we mentor. We start at 715, we end at 315, but not really. We pay for a touring bus and keep them till 515 and put them on the bus with a healthy snack. And then you talk about accountability. Faculty, staff student, and parent. Let's start with faculty and staff. First of all, it's culture. Again, it's up to me to set the culture in my building because if I don't, culture will come, grab my climate, grab my strategies, they'll be in tow, and I'll be saying, where'd it go? And so we have to set the culture in the building. We ask teachers, why do you want to teach at a hard-to-teach, low-performing urban school? But more importantly, what percentage of it is it of yours? that the students learn? How do you own the learning? And I want to hear 
100%. I might take 95. I don't want to hear, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Maybe 50%. They don't teach at CGLA. Because we make sure leaders hire teachers who believe, highly effective teachers who believe in our business model of measurements and standards and benchmarking. And then I stood up probably the first four months and asked a question that changed CGLA forever in faculty meeting. I said, can someone explain to me how 0% or 6% proficiency relates to these A's and B's on the transcript? I'm from the country, by the way, if you can't tell by now. My father would have said, you could have heard a rat tinkle on cotton. <laughs> except, except. His language would have been a little bit stronger. And then we made sure, we made sure that we put an instructional model in the building that was based on literacy. When 81% of the kids come in behind in reading, they need to have their little behinds in that seat reading for comprehension and understanding. We read every morning at CGLA right after we feed them breakfast. And then we teach teachers how to teach, or we try our best in a low-performing urban school. If you don't think that's different, you probably don't belong in an urban school. You probably don't belong in an urban school if you don't send homework home because you think they won't or can't do it. Or you probably don't belong in an urban school if I send you out on an expeditionary learning trip. I do not do field trips. It has to have meaning. And you come back and tell me how they behave rather than what they learned. You probably don't belong in an urban school. Because we hold students accountable and held them accountable to their true intellectual levels, not the perceived ones. I also stood up the first four months and said to kids, this is not your dismal data. You are smarter than this. This is an adult issue. And we're going to do better with you and for you. All children who go out behind in the summer, whether you come in in the sixth grade or go out behind, you owe me three or four weeks in the summer with your behinds in the seat so I can get you ready for August. And then we are the Mustangs. Whoa means stop. Reteach, retool, reassess. And we coined the word BAB, B-A-B-B. -B. The children know what that means. You will be brilliant at basics and beyond. And then... You, all, you always have children in both schools who say, well, Dr. Swafford, we were in charge before you got here. What makes you think it's any differently? And I said, today's the last day you have to ask me a crazy question like that. Because I don't believe that behavior and poverty have anything to do with one another. And to prove it, we've driven down discipline 87% since 2012 when we arrived. We, we try to protect discipline time. And then there's parents. You've heard of in-school suspension, I'm sure. ISS, I stand up in front of my parents and say, because in an urban school, if you build one, they will come. I say to my parents, my ISS is your home address. Come and get them every time after they misbehave the first time and meet with one of my administrators. And attendance, in an urban school, you don't want to come or you want to be late. Suffice it to say I have a truancy officer who loves her job. And if I ask the parents to leave you for that geometry lesson, that's what I need for you to do for tutoring, unless you're going to teach it when you get home. And then, of course, you know, you think about PR. I'm on a PR campaign. Parent replacement. <laughs> I want to do everything for a kid a parent can't do. And so, you know, when the... It, Expeditionary learning is with a purpose. It, lack of exposure is no excuse in my building. ACT, low-income children get two waivers. That's not enough. We've proven that, and I'll show you later. We pay for it three more times and the preparation for that ACT, and it's working. So you can see that I really believe in accountability and reporting and so forth. But Elaine has a couple of sayings, too. You can't miss what you can't measure and you sure can't fix what you can't own. That leads me to understanding the pace of change. You know, Billy and Emily Hassel talked about the pace of change. Our 
power change at CGLA, our long term was forced to be short term, comparatively speaking. Remember, we were issued that ultimatum. And I would suggest other schools follow that same ultimatum because in school reform, we think it has to be slow and incremental and molasses. It doesn't work. Or we want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and wipe the slate clean. I use the Elaine partly clean rapid fire method. We set new norms in the building, and we met with every teacher. And so one of the things that we did that I stood up the first seven months, it was hard, had to have a spine, and said to everyone, you got to reapply for your jobs. But I can tell you, those who remained knew that they had to drink that philosophical Kool-Aid and like the flavor served. <laughs> and so we, we made sure that, but we committed to meeting with every teacher. A business model, we did a SWOT analysis. It's amazing from 2012 June to now how those weaknesses have turned into opportunities and strengths. And so we met with every teacher. But we also have what we call intentional intervention. We know where the bottom 25% is as well as the top 25% because every kid in the building has four of these, not one. It's for every subject. We baseline and we benchmark three or four or five times a year. And so we know where our kids are. But just when we thought we had it figured out, we had to get really smart. Because TN Ready came along, didn't it? The state mandated test. So we had to make sure, first of all, that it was attainable. My kids will tell you she makes our head hurt because she stretches us. Or, and it had to be time sensitive because we knew where we had to be at at the right time. Because we only had nine months to begin with, remember, to fix that. And so it may seem radical, but a business model that's proven to work, has the CGLA Mustangs thriving. We've gone from the brink of closure to reward school status and sustained it. And that same class that came in with that 6% dismal data, and that kid who said to me, we needed someone who pushed us and told us we could, that kid came in below basic. She is now ACT college ready. And I'll tell you, we've answered the ultimatum. We have certainly are answering how do you fix broken schools. We have jumped out of that archaic pedagogical box. And we know the answer to whether it's the switch or the light bulb. You know, I have kids who have scored 25 and jumped into the ACT 25 plus club. Why is that important? Because three years ago, we had zero in the club. They've all applied to college. I started with a question, and I'll end with one. Can we really afford not to give ourselves an ultimatum when it comes to the sake of the children and get out of that box? I suggest we do and start experiencing student success. Thank you.